In some cities, those suspected of being sick are being rounded up, with multiple unverified videos showing the quarantine squads at work. It's all adding to a growing sense of disbelief and dread. I don't want to be taken away like that, a child can be heard saying. Outdoors. This drone shows how the deadly disease outbreak has shut down a city of 11 million people. And as the coronavirus continues to spread, with the latest tally at 906 dead and more than 40,000 infected, it's no surprise that fear and fake news has also been spreading on social media, like this popular conspiracy theory. Is it just me, or does that look more like they are preparing mass graves in advance? The virus continues to spread. Controls and restrictions are increasing right across China, where more than 600 people have now died and another 31,000 have been infected. Coronavirus emergency, a 15th case, has now been confirmed in the U.S. as we learned that American celebrating his retirement on the Diamond Princess cruise ship has now come down with the Michael, the idea is to start getting people off of this boat. And today was the first phase, but the number of people who actually qualified and wanted to get off the boat was much lower than we expected. This morning, the evacuation of that cruise ship, holding more than 3,600 people on quarantine, began with a trickle. To start uh, this process, 11 guests have chosen to be disembarked. The captain announcing 11 people chose to leave. The first wave tested are passengers over 80 years old, as well as people with pre-existing conditions. Beds and equipment. People have been sleeping in gymnasiums and the like if they're sick. They're sort of setting up these the kind of crude, temporary hospitals for uh, to act as isolation wards uh, and so yeah it is a pretty dire situation inside Hubei province but right across China I mean it's funny if you could see in detail like out the window behind me there's nobody out on the streets in Beijing either people do not want to leave their homes and in a funny way it's the way the government would like it to be because by not having people gathering, by having so many people in this city working from home, or having staggered working arrangements, so they're not all piling into the underground train system at the same time. This disease is a marathon, not a sprint. The situation will get worse before it gets better. We will be guided by the science. Be in no doubt, we will do everything that is effective to tackle this virus and keep Ian Thompson is ready to get back home to his family in Detroit. It's been two weeks since he landed back in the U.S. from the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak. We get a, a document first signed by the CDC tomorrow. It's part of the process of going out, and that's given to us, so it shows that we're, you know, we can show that to anybody, and that's, uh, you know, we, we do not have the virus. But not everyone who flew back from Wuhan was so lucky. Yesterday, the 13th case of coronavirus was confirmed in San Diego, a patient who arrived on a U.S. chartered flight last week. But President Trump remains confident the U.S. has a handle on it. I think it's going to all work out fine. Rough stuff, I tell you, rough, rough stuff. But I think it's going to work out good. Around the world, fears of transmitting the coronavirus are growing by the day. <laughs> In Beijing, an eerie emptiness set in during the morning rush hour. Officials there ordered citizens coming back from the epidemic zones to quarantine themselves for at least two weeks. In Hong Kong, authorities evacuated a residential high-rise after two tenants who live on different floors contracted the virus. Thousands of others remain quarantined on military bases. It's good to have a break. Fresh air is really fresh now. And on cruise ships like the Diamond Princess docked in Japan, which has been on lockdown for a week. 
The World Health Organization is now on the ground in China. It will assemble a team of global scientists this week in an effort to speed up the development of treatments and vaccines. We may see numbers like in any epidemic go up and down in, in, in coming days. What really is important rather than uh, making predictions is really to work hard uh, to try to get solutions. Hubei and Wuhan are both loyalists to Xi Jinping, uh, especially the man in charge of the province, Ying Ong. He comes from Shanghai. Now, he's a man known for tough security security measures, but also last year he implemented a citywide recycling program in Shanghai. Now, I know that probably doesn't sound that impressive, but in a city of 23 million, almost overnight to get all of those people to suddenly follow new rules, he managed to pull it off. That program is still in place and it's being carried out across China. So here's a man who's known for security and implementing really big projects. Makeshift hospitals are one of the defining images of this epidemic. But this is the original in Beijing, built in seven days to fight the SARS outbreak in 2003. Now they are rebuilding it to fight a new virus. One that has killed more people in China alone than SARS did worldwide. The long, painful memory of SARS has resurfaced in this new epidemic. Beijing was badly affected, and so this city of more than 20 million people feels deserted again. This is one of the smart farms growing tomatoes in Cholabukdu province. At the push of a button, a gigantic shading net rolls out and covers the ceiling to control the temperature. The area's humidity is manipulated by a ventilator, also on the farm owner's command. This technology is representative of modern smart farms in South Korea. What separates this smart facility from other tech-reliant farms, however, is that the owner has recently decided to make the best out of AI technology to increase the plant yield. The newly applied AI can collect and analyze big data to find the optimal conditions for tomatoes to grow according to the current growth phase of each individual plant. The owner says the AI has raised the tomato yield by nearly 80%. AI has made farming so much more convenient. I can easily access it at all times, even when I'm overseas on a trip. The AI reduced total labor hours down to an hour and a half, less than half the time he previously had spent working each day. What's more, heating costs have been cut by more than 40 percent. Government officials have also highlighted these results and vowed to help more farms install the tech. The farming population is continuing to decline and young people are unwilling to join the industry as farming is very labor intensive and demanding. But the new agricultural sector will be different. The Rural Development Administration says it plans to expand the application of the new AI developments into smart farms for strawberries and bell peppers. U.S. aviation authorities are investigating another questionable landing involving an Air Canada plane at the San Francisco airport. This is the second incident in several months. So, Arthi, what went wrong? So this was around uh, 9 p.m. on Sunday evening that there was an Air Canada flight that was leaving from Montreal and set to land at San Francisco's airport, SFO. So this was flight 781, and it was initially cleared to land on runway 28R. Now, this was uh, probably a, a good duration of time before the actual landing. Then it turned out that air traffic control said that they were fearful that the preceding flight, a different United flight, wouldn't have cleared the runway in time. So they repeatedly asked the Air Canada pilot to go around, not to land, that it was not cleared for landing anymore, that it needed to go around until the runway was fully clear to make sure that it was safe. This is an excerpt of the communication with air traffic control. Take a listen. Yeah, 781, go around. Yeah, 781, go around. Air Canada, 781, go around. Canada, 781, go around. Canada, 781, go around. Oh, yeah. So you can see there that it was actually about half a dozen times that you heard air traffic control request the flight 781, the Air Canada flight, to go around and there was no response. And then following, there was one communication that said, hey, there seems to be a problem with our radio and that was from Air Canada and air traffic control said, yes, that's BBC evident. News has learned that Ottawa is having another look at an old plan to share firefighting resources with Australia. Outside of the box proposals that governments often say they'd like to do 
but rarely accomplish. The Canadian government has had a proposal on its desk for four years, calling for the construction of at least 14 federal water bombers and a ship that would be shared with Australia, traveling back and forth between the two countries as each country hits their own wildfire season. The pitch apparently made its way up to former Environment Minister Catherine McKenna in 2016. A copy of that proposal was obtained by CBC News. The idea was quietly shelved back then, but interest in the notion was rekindled recently following Australia's desperate pleas for help in containing their wildfires. I think when we initially proposed the idea, it was too soon. Um, it, uh, the Fort Mac fire had not occurred. Um, there were still, um, and I won't suggest in the government, but there's still people in, in society in Canada who were denying, you know, extreme weather events or climate change, that type of thing. I think what's important today is that the conditions are such that, look, um, it's real, so let's do something about it. The proposal, originally pitched four years ago, called for a multi-million dollar lease arrangement similar to the one signed with the Navy for its supply ship, the Asterix. The proposal suggested that a shipyard and an aircraft maker deliver the planes, the ship and crews with the cost shared between the two nations. Company officials today, however, say they're open to other arrangements and that the intent is to start a dialogue about whether countries have the right tools to deal with extreme weather events. There has been no comment from the Australian High Commission or Canadian officials. Europe's big three, Great Britain, France and Germany, have announced they are invoking a dispute provision of the 2015 JCPOA, better known as the Iran nuclear deal. It's a bid, they say, to try to save what's left of this landmark Obama-era agreement. Now, the resolution mechanism is the most serious option under the terms of this deal that will be put before a panel of all nations a party to this deal. So here well, these European powers are supporting the JCPOA as the rope supports the hanging man. Uh, they are uh, purportedly seeking to save it whilst at the same time attempting to kill it. In fact, Boris Johnson, as you might expect, is right out front. He says uh, if the JCPOA has to go and that Britain's under pressure uh, to disassociate itself from it, then a Trump deal will have to replace it, which again on the face of it might be a solution, except we don't know what the Trump deal would likely to be, whether it would be remotely acceptable to Iran and others, and whether it's just an attempt to, as Pompeo said uh, today, to turn Iran into Norway. Good luck with that. <laughs>